大家晚安。嗯、um, ，In Professor Sandel's book, Justice: What's the Right Thing to Do, he gave many examples where political leaders or just ordinary citizens are put in the situation where they are forced to make very critical decisions. And there's one example, Michael, which stands out in my mind, was the example you give about what happened in 2005 when a very small reconnaissance team um, from the US operating in the middle of Afghanistan trying to look for a Taliban leader. Uh, it's a team of four soldiers. The four soldiers, while they were operating this secret mission, they came across uh, two Afghan goat herd, Mu Yang Ren, two men, innocent uh, men, and a young boy, and a hundred or so very noisy goats. So this um, team leader was in a hard place because he had to make a decision whether he should leave, let these um, two goat herds and a young boy go free at the risk of their own lives and the failure, complete failure of their important mission or he should kill these three innocent people. Um, I don't know how you would, what you would do, but this, uh, his name is Trussell, I think. What's his name? Neutral. Neutral. Well, what he decided later on, he uh, was recalling this incident, he said his Christian face persuaded him that he should not kill these innocent farmers, and therefore he let them go. But the result, the very harsh and cruel result was, uh, they, these four were ambushed, surrounded by the Taliban's, and the, the, the price they pay is not only um, in his team of four soldiers, the three were killed, plus the, the crew, the 16-member crew in the helicopter, uh, which was trying to come to rescue them, the 16 of them were also killed. So this was a moral as well as political decision which cost a lot. And when this um, team leader was recalling this incident, of course, he said this is the worst decision he has made in his life and it was a wrong decision. Um, Michael said in his book that in a democratic society, we are making difficult decisions like this almost every day, which is true. However, when I was reading this book, uh, especially this small um, incident and anecdote reminded me of what myself and many of you who are here have read, uh, a, a little anecdote that we have read when we were in high school. Does any one of you remember Zi Yu Lun Zhan? No, or yes? No, <laughs> Zi Yu Lun Zhan. I'll tell Michael the story. Zi Yu Lun Zhan is from Zuo Zhuan, from the Book of History, which was written about 2,500 years back, about an incident, an anecdote, uh, about a battle dated 685 BC, about a battle. Um, there was this um, Song kingdom fighting against a very much more powerful enemy of the Chu kingdom, Song Guo and Chu Guo. And the Song commander leading his troop in front of a river, and his advisor told him, look, the Chu army was trying to cross the river, and they were, they were scattered in chaos, they were trying to cross the river, there were many of soldiers were in the middle of the river, so this is the time to attack. And this song commander said, no, my morals tell me 
you should not attack the enemy when they are crossing the river, when they are not prepared. So he would wait, and he waited. And then the army crossed the river, got on land, and his advisor, military advisor said, now attack because they have not formed their uh, uh, battle format. And this commander said, no, my morals tell me that we should not attack until they are ready in position and form their, their battle uh, formation. So he waited. Finally, the much powerful enemy, they really formatted, ready to fight, and they fought like two gentlemen troops. The result, of course, was a total devastation to the Song troops. The commander himself got so badly injured that he died from it, and his country toppled. Everything lost. So your story about the 2005 small um, uh, team operation reminded me. What I'm going to say is this kind of moral, critical moral and political decisions have, been, have always been there. But in a diverse, open society, where everybody has a stance and everybody has, has his peace of mind, it becomes even more complicated. And um, um, in today's Taiwan, we have a lot of debates going on, a lot. And a lot of the issues uh, have been touched upon in your books. We have been debating whether the death penalty should or should not be abolished. We're talking about that in Taiwan. And we have, debating, we have been debating how well or how poorly the Taiwanese have performed in terms of dealing with our past injustices. And we have been debating and discussing what our stance towards the practice of human rights in China should be or should not be, and taught between moral and political deliberations, we have been debating what is the right thing to do vis-a-vis -vis China. And we have been debating whether the year-end bonuses, Nian Zhong Jiangqing, promised for the civil servants is just or not. And we have been debating and worried about the concentration of the media in the hands of the few. And some of us are especially suspicious about possible influences from the Chinese mainland across the state, influences which are both market-driven as well as politically maneuvered, and both of which are discussed in your books. So some of our issues are universal, the same as in the United States, as the media buyout, for example, is a worldwide phenomenon, but some are particular to Taiwan because of our international and political situation. But please relax, Michael, because the audience, our audience is a very, very reasonable crowd. They do not, they do not expect you to advise them. Can I speak for you? I don't think they expect that you would advise them on how to solve Taiwanese problems. We have to deal with our problems ourselves. But your insight into the essence of things, the way you probe the method of thinking, and the way you tear apart fuzzy issues, fuzzy things, make things clear, are what excite the audiences today, including the audiences in front of the TV camera later on. So let's give a very, very warm round of applause for Michael Sandel. Okay. Thank you very much, Ying Tai, for that generous introduction. I can tell what a wonderful storyteller you are. <laughs> and I know your famous reputation. But listening to your opening remarks, it occurred to me that 
you instinctively understand and convey the close connection between storytelling and philosophy, between storytelling and moral reflection. Philosophers often deal in abstract principles. And very often it's difficult for philosophers who deal in abstractions to relate philosophical ideas to the world and to the dilemmas that we face in our public life and in our personal lives. I think one of the most important ways that philosophy can inform our everyday lives is through storytelling and through the use of vivid examples which often can bring out the ethical dilemmas and the competing moral principles that we face as we try to decide what is the right thing to do, whether we are making those decisions within our families or political communities. So I'm, I'm a great believer, Ying Tai, in the power of stories to enable us to think about big philosophical questions and as a way of enabling philosophy to inform the dilemmas we face every day. In both of my two recent books, Justice and my new book, What Money Can't Buy, I try to use examples drawn from everyday life and also from politics to illustrate philosophical themes. Looking at the world in which we live, there are two big challenges. One of them has directly to do with justice, the debate and the rising concern, especially in affluent societies, about equality and inequality and the growing gap between rich and poor that seems to accompany economic growth and rising affluence around the world. How to deal with the fact that many of the policies that provide rising affluence and prosperity also seem to come at the moral and civic price of widening inequalities and what our societies can do to address those widening inequalities. That's one challenge that, that we are all facing. A second challenge has to do, I think, not only with the gap between rich and poor, but with the question of just how much money is able to buy in our societies. For example, should money only be able to buy material goods, luxury items, flat screen televisions, and fancy vacations, if that were all that money could buy, those material goods, then the gap between rich and poor would not matter so much. But it's a different matter when money comes to buy not only flat screen televisions and cars and, and vacations, but also political influence or control of the media, to take one of the examples you mentioned, or access to good education or to good health care, or to greater voice in civic life. And so this second set of questions, which I deal with in the new book, says that we need to have a debate about what should be 
the role of money and markets in a good society. It's closely connected to the first question about equality and inequality because it asks what advantages, what access to the good things in life should depend on money, on the ability of some to be able to afford access not just to luxuries, but to fundamental goods connected with health and education and welfare. And is there the danger that when money reaches into certain spheres of life, such as health and education and political influence and voice, that it can be corrupting and can drive out attitudes and values that we care about. So these are two broad sets of concerns uh, that I would like to really open for discussion. As Ying Tai said, I, I don't come here with solutions to Taiwan's problems. I really come here in a spirit of, of learning. And I already feel that I've had a, a wonderful uh, set of lessons and tutorials in some of the questions facing Taiwan. Um, but I think philosophy at its best is not really about scholars of philosophy lecturing citizens about how to solve their problems or how to organize their lives. I think that philosophy at its best, and this goes back in the West all the way to the dialogues of Socrates, is about argument, about questioning, about providing a framework for debate, not so much to give a single answer to those debates, but to provide a framework that invites and challenges citizens to deliberate together about hard questions, including hard questions about justice and the good society, on which we do disagree. But there are better and worse ways of conducting our disagreements and so what I hope to do is to engage in these days of my first visit to Taiwan, to engage in dialogue and discussion about how philosophy can inform the world in which we live and the aspirations we all have to create more just societies that come closer to realizing, in practice, the common good. Thank you very much for welcoming me here, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Michael. Tell me how you grew up, especially, especially your intellectual growth. So uh, you were born and you spent your first 13 years in the Midwest, basically. Yes. And then you moved to uh, California, which is a place where individualism is on the flag of, of, of everything. Right. Um, there is a process of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, like, like any good American, I grew up um, steeped in values of individualism. And this was especially uh, uh, true in the uh, late 60s and early 1970s when I was in school and then in university. And after going to high school in California, um, I went to university, I went to Brandeis University in Massachusetts. And I was always deeply interested in politics. 
I was a political junkie. I followed political campaigns and, and political arguments. And in high school, I was, I was on the debate team. And so I always loved argument. I hadn't studied much philosophy. I tried to in university. And they gave us these books, I thought very difficult books. Plato and Aristotle and they asked us to try to read them and I, I couldn't make much sense of them. And so I put them aside. Were you a good student? Did you fail any courses? No. <laughs> but but I, I migrated to what I thought were more concrete things. I mean, more concrete than these philosophy books. And so I studied uh, politics and history and economics and, and the liberal arts. And I, I was an eager student. I, I loved s school. But I figured that philosophy was too remote and too distant and too abstract and too, just too difficult. And when I graduated from college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do or to be when I grew up. I thought maybe be a political journalist because I so loved following politics. I thought maybe I would go into politics and run for office. Um, and I had a chance to postpone that decision uh, when I had an opportunity to go off and do some graduate studies in Britain. And I thought I would spend a short time reading some philosophy so I would understand the background to politics and then go back to more practical things. I thought I could read through my way through the history of political philosophy maybe in one term and then I would return to actual political and economic questions. But one term, it was, I could barely begin after one term and then two and before I knew it I spent four years and became fascinated with political philosophy. But now I saw more of the connection between these abstract ideas and the, the political questions that interested me. And so I wound up being a teacher of political philosophy. And when I started to write, I, I found myself challenging some of the individualistic, what I saw now as the excesses of market-driven individualism that I had taken for granted growing up in the U.S. And so I, I explored questions about whether, whether we can even engage in politics without thinking about and arguing about big questions of the common good and of virtue. Market-driven societies tend to leave aside in public debate questions of virtue and the common good and relegate those questions to private life. And I think even today we have a tendency to conduct our political debates without really taking up controversial moral questions because we fear the disagreement that those debates will inevitably bring but I now think it's a mistake to try to conduct public discourse without engaging big controversial questions about ethics and the good life. I don't think those questions can be left only to private life. Because every choice we make, including choices about all the issues on the list that you mentioned at the beginning, do involve big questions about the human good, about morality, and I think of politics, if looking at societies around the world, there is such frustration today with the terms of political discourse, with the arguments that are framed by the political parties and politicians. And I think one of the reasons there is such deep frustration is that in so many societies around the world, we've, for the recent decades, had a kind of market-driven politics. Economics has crowded out politics in the best sense, in the highest sense. And that has drained 
public discourse of moral energy and purpose and has left us with a managerial, technocratic kind of public discourse that, people, that nobody finds inspiring. And so I, I think that in order to revitalize public discourse and to address some of the big questions of justice and the common good with which you began, we need to elevate the terms of our public discourse and to engage more directly with the moral convictions that citizens bring with them and not ask citizens to leave their moral convictions outside when they enter the public square. Can you tell us about your jelly bean story because it's really wonderful. What would you do if you were a high school or college student and you want somebody, decision maker, to listen to you? What would you do? When I was in high school, I was 18, my last year in high school, I was the president of the student body and I thought it would be interesting, this is in California, interesting to invite the governor of California, who was then Ronald Reagan, to come to the school and have a debate with us. Almost everyone in my school held views which differed from the views of Ronald Reagan, who was one of the um, most outspoken conservative politicians at that time in the United States. And my, uh, my school, the students in my school, did not share his views at all. He was, we, he was uh, in favor of the Vietnam War and we were against it. He was against the United Nations in those days. We were for it. He was against 18-year-olds having the vote, which was being debated at that time. And needless to say, we were in favor. And so I sent a letter inviting him to come for a debate at our school. And I didn't get a response. And then my mother read in a magazine that Ronald Reagan loved jelly beans. And so I bought a six pound bag of jelly beans <laughs> and put them in a box with a red bow and an invitation. And I took them to his house. He actually, his house was n quite near the school. And when I came to deliver this box of jelly beans, there were security guards at his driveway who wanted to know what was in the box. And I said, jelly beans. They were rather skeptical. And they searched the box and they squeezed the jelly beans. <laughs> when they decided that it seemed safe enough, they let me deliver it to his front door. He wasn't there at the time, but I left it for him with the invitation. And a few days later, he called the school and said he would come. And as I mentioned before, I was a debater in high school. And I thought a pretty good debater. And I didn't think it would be very difficult to win a debate against, well, a politician. <laughs> <laughs> you know, young people are often full of confidence. Young people, yeah. Young people can be very arrogant, too. So I prepared very carefully with the hardest questions I could think of to put to Ronald Reagan. And I, we sat pretty much as we're sitting now, he and I. I had very long hair. <laughs> as did everyone else in my school then. This was 1971. Um, Ronald Reagan did not have very long hair. <laughs> so we had a, a debate. I asked my questions. He answered them. And then we opened up the session to 
my classmates who also asked him the hardest questions they could think of. By the end of the session, almost no one agreed with the answers he had given to our questions. And yet, he did it, he replied, and engaged us with such seriousness and respect and charm and humor that although we couldn't quite understand why, we all liked him when he left and he waved. <laughs> <laughs> and nine years later, perhaps through the same skills of engage, engaging charm, he was elected president of the United States. And we had glimpsed, perhaps in an early uh, moment, a sense of how he was able to do this. So, despite my, what I thought were my great debating skills, I, I don't think that I won that debate at all. Uh, but it was an early experience in engaging in dialogue and argument across real differences of opinion um, that, uh, that I remember to this day. We are actually remembering this, commemorating this Human Rights Day tomorrow, the World UN Declaration of Human Rights. Tomorrow morning, uh, there's going to be a ceremony at, the, uh, at our uh, Human Rights Museum, where the president is going to arrive as well. And we are going to sit together with former political prisoners in Taiwan, some of them uh, have spent five years in jail, some of them 10 years, some of them 20 years. Tomorrow, um, my uh, lunch with you, I have invited uh, Mr. Shi Mingde to meet you as well. He has spent 25 years in jail for his belief, political beliefs. So Taiwan has gone through dark period as well. So fortunately, um, after 1987, in the 90s, we begin to work with our past, um, which is, of course, not sufficient, but this path has started to debate, to discuss, to work with past injustices. Um, I don't know, it's not fair to pose this question to you, but well, I'll try it anyway. Um, you have such intellectual skills, and I always remember the jelly beans strategy. So the question is this, suppose you were a uh, policeman in Taiwan of the 1950s when your job was to investigate or actually to uh, arrest these political prisoners. Um, you might be thinking that I'm doing this this is my job, my responsibility, and I have to do it correctly. Or you may not believe in the system, but you take it as a job and you have to do it. What would you tell a person like this on the job? I would say first that questions of justice, some of the most difficult questions of justice involve coming to terms with our past, especially with dark episodes in our past and some of the deepest divisions within societies come from disagreements about the meaning of the past or the assignment of moral responsibility for past wrongs. These are wrenching questions and the strongest societies are the ones who can summon the moral courage to face their past um, uh, honestly. I have asked 
three uh, good friends of mine who represent uh, different fields of expertise to each raise one question to Michael. Uh, Huang Dafu, Yuan Zhang. Dafu, Qing. I have had many chances of watching you on the YouTube uh, <laughs> as you gave lectures to Harvard students. I guess these are first year students, right? First, second year? Oh. Undergraduate of all four. Undergraduates years. of all years. Okay. And uh, so I know your method of teaching, and I'm very impressed by what I have seen. Uh, the first question is, we, just one question, right? This is the first question. <laughs> just one, please, because I have to open the floor soon. Okay, so can I weave them together into one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, many of the faculty members here in Taiwan also teach justice, ethics, and many other subjects related to these two. Uh, there's always a question about how effective the teaching has done for the students. Do you know whether you can actually influence these students and what's the evidence? And uh, your method of teaching is extraordinary. And I am dying to know how, how you influence them uh, or how they influence you as, as you progress in many years of teaching. Um, and then finally, I know you're not trying to tell the students what to do because you are engaging in a debate. But I just want to know whether in your own personal life you're able to, uh, you are actually practicing the way you preach. Do you debate with your wife, in other words? <laughs> <laughs> is, is the question clear to I you? Think so. okay. I think so. So I'm only allowed to ask one question, so this will be it. but there's still chance. Well, the, the best answer to the last part of your question, I suppose, would come from my wife and two sons. It, uh, it is actually, thinking uh, back, from the time my sons were very young, my wife and I uh, have engaged them around the dinner table in discussion and uh, open debate. This has been my experience, at least, that civic education begins ar around the dinner table and takes its form from a, a spirit of discussion and deliberation um, of that kind within a family. And then, ideally, as students go through school and through university and they take courses in philosophy and ethics, it continues. But uh, it's interesting, Aristotle, who's one of the philosophers um, I've been influenced by, has what seems like a strange statement for a philosopher. He says that young people um, are not well suited to listening to and learning from lectures on ethics and philosophy. And only later, he says, after they've had some experience and after they've developed certain habits of ethical behavior, only then can they really learn from philosophy books and from lectures on philosophy. And that's because the good life and reflection about ethics and justice, he thinks, requires cultivating certain habits through practice. And so in a way, maybe this explains why when I was a, in my first year in college, I couldn't understand those books by the philosophers. It's only after engaging in a practice of debating at the dinner table, following the news, um, 
developing certain civic skills that one can, is really in a position to learn from philosophy about what it all really means. And that, in a, in a way, is what I'm trying to build upon in the, to go back to the first part of your question, in my teaching. I tried to, the reason that I, from the beginning, taught through dialogue and argument with the students is that I tried to remember what it was like to be a student. And I asked myself the question, what would have engaged me as a beginning university student in philosophy? And for me, it was connecting philosophical ideas with the world in which we live and the dilemmas we confront and the opinions we already have. And and it seems to work. It seems to draw people in. No systematic evidence, it really uh, evidence based on what students who have been out for a time after they've graduated report. And the real test, I think, is when, and in a way this is the most gratifying testimony, is when students come back and say, that studying political philosophy in this way transformed the way they look at the world and think about their own role in the world, their own place in the world, their own aspirations. Philosophy, unlike many subjects in a universe that are taught in a university, at its best, is a transformative discipline because it invites students to not just to learn new subject matter or to gather new information, but it invites students to critically reflect on their own assumptions, their own convictions, their own beliefs. It invites them to figure out what they believe and why as they confront the world as a citizen. And so that, I think, is the ultimate test that each student has to answer for himself or herself. Thank you, Andrew. Um, well, the same. Um, I did exactly the same as you did. I think dinner table debates and discussions are probably the most important educational part in one's real life. Just last week, uh, I had dinner with my son. And uh, there was no debate. I was under great pressure. We had dinner together in the restaurant, and uh, the, I was tired, I was exhausted, and I was short-tempered. And there came this uh, waitress. She got the wrong order, and then she got the wrong food, and then she got the wrong bill. I think I was not very nice because I was losing my patience. When that occurred, my son across the table, he said coolly, he said, Mom, please may I remind you what Mark Twain once said. Mark Twain said, I judge a person's character not on the way how she deals with her superior, but the way she deals with her subordinates. Wow. <laughs> I fell flat on my dish. <laughs> and dinner table discussions, I think that's what you have with your, with your children as well, and students as well. Professor Wu, please. Your question? Before I post my question, uh, may I go back to the issue uh, Intai just uh, raised uh, about uh, the policeman, the, the perpetrator, that issue. I mean, uh, I and one, some of my colleagues uh, founded an association for truth and reconciliation in Taiwan. Maybe it's uh, one, uh, maybe only one non-governmental TRC in, in the world. And uh, in dealing with uh, traditional justice, we have a very big problem, problem in uh, how to deal with the perpetrators. Uh, so there are so, uh, many former political prisoners who are very concerned about this. Uh, of course, they, uh, most of the perpetrators were already dead or were pretty old. But uh, anyway, how, sh uh, how do we decide their moral responsibility? Many victims want to know that. And uh, I don't think 
they will be content with uh, our telling them that uh, we have a collective res responsibility after they have been tortured, after their parents were, were executed, and also um, imprisoned for so many years. So it's very, I agree with uh, Professor Sandel that it's a very difficult question. But somehow, but it's also very urgent. <laughs> somehow we have to, to, to decide, to make a decision, to answer that. Okay, anyway. And my question, uh, I'll make it very, uh, make it very quick. Uh, simply put, uh, Professor Stanton, are you, do you have any plan to write uh, a book for political, political ideas, I mean politicians? Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, I, uh, I would emphasize on the question of responsibility for historic injustices that any uh, morally responsible um, response has to include both individual and collective responsibility. I did not mean to emphasize uh, collective responsibility and to neglect individual responsibility. I think that um, any uh, response has to include both individual and collective responsibility. As for the second part of the question, my books are directed at citizens generally. Am I going to write, or should I write another book for uh, politicians and political elites? My answer to that question is, no, I would invite them to read my books, <laughs> too. The, I think that um, it's important to try to uh, connect philosophy with the world. Um, in both of my recent books, Justice, and what money can't buy. I try to frame some of the big philosophical questions that are at stake in contemporary debates. Debates about justice and debates about the role that money and markets should play in our society. I want those books to be accessible on one level to scholars who will be aware of the philosophical ideas that are implicit in the stories and the examples and the cases. But I also want them to be accessible to citizens generally. And I try to make the books inviting by using the stories and the examples and the moral dilemmas about justice or about the role of money in ways that everyone can identify with. But having engaged the reader, I then want to encourage and invite and challenge readers to discuss these questions among themselves because those discussions will lead to the bigger philosophical questions. And that's the kind of debate, the public debate, I think we should have. I think that there is, so politicians and political elites are welcome to read these books and to engage in this discussion. I want to encourage them to do so. But I think one of the best ways of trying to elevate the terms of our public discourse is not simply to hope that political parties and politicians will do better, but to contribute to uh, and to invite a broader public conversation about these questions. Because I think that in every place I've ever been, politicians and political leaders will will only respond when citizens generally ask for something better, for a better kind of public discourse. And that's what I think we should aim at. I would say further that 
the, the general readers and the students that I'm hoping to engage in these questions, many of them, if they're inspired and if they care about the common good and if they're attracted to this way of thinking and arguing and debating about these ethical questions, many of them someday, sooner rather than later, will themselves be political elites and political leaders. And so if they read my books now, that may, be, that may save me from having to write a separate book for political leaders a generation from now. Are you satisfied with the way um, the public, dis the vitality of the public discourse in the United States today? Are you satisfied with it? Or, um, to put it another way, do you notice a change in the nature of public, uh, of, uh, public discourse in the United States before and after 9-11? I'm not satisfied with the terms of public discourse in the United States. And the reason I'm not is uh, we have uh, intense partisanship. Uh, the parties are at a deadlock. But even more trouble. Are you talking about the United States or are you talking about Taiwan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was initially talking about the United States, but you'll, you'll tell me to what degree there are similarities. Um, I think that the most serious um, defect in American public discourse is a reluctance to engage with big questions, including big uh, questions of ethics and justice and the common good. We are not very good at doing that. And I think this is for two reasons. First, politicians know that engaging with big moral questions will inevitably lead to controversy. We disagree about uh, big moral questions. And politicians like to avoid controversy. And so we try to uh, make public discourse be about practical and technical questions. How best to generate more economic growth, for example, which is important. But there's a second reason, I think, for the emptiness of the public discourse we currently have in the United States. And that is that for the past three decades, uh, the past three decades have been a kind of uh, an, an age of market triumphalism, certainly in, in the US, but also perhaps in other parts of the world. And by market triumphalism, I mean we have assumed and accepted a kind of faith that markets are the primary instrument for achieving the public good. Part of the appeal of markets is the belief that they deliver economic growth. But I think the deeper appeal of this market triumphalist faith is that markets seem to be a way of solving public problems that is neutral with regard to competing values and ethical convictions. Because when two parties make a deal with one another, they agree to exchange this good for this amount of money, we assume that the parties themselves can place whatever value they want on the goods they exchange, and provided they come to an agreement, nobody else has to assess the value of those goods. Now, this may be true enough if we're talking about the value of a flat screen television, if we're talking about material goods. But if we're talking about 
health or education. If we're talking about whether, for example, there should be a market in organs for transplantation or blood for transfusion, or a market in paid pregnancy, surrogate motherhood, or for, for that matter, a prostitution. That involves an exchange of money for a certain kind of good. There are moral values at stake that all of us are capable of judging. And likewise, when we're talking about health and education and civic life, should there be a market? If you take the pure market logic, why not have a free market in votes? Michael? Part of the reason why we allow ourselves to be driven by market isn't it that we are, because we are afraid that the government might step in and make the judgment for us. When the government makes the moral judgment for us, then we are faced with the, the two evils. And many people might say, well, the market is even better because we don't want the government making moral judgment for us. Does well, that, that play is, a role? That is, that is the worry that I think um, leads us to the market faith I was describing. But I think it's a mistaken response. Of course, we need to protect against governments imposing moral judgments on us. That's true. But I think it's a, it's a mistake to have assumed, as, many, uh, as has been assumed in many market societies over the last three decades, it's a mistake to assume that the alternative to government imposition of values is to let markets decide everything. Because uh, the mistaken assumption is that markets are neutral instruments, morally neutral. But what I try to show with example after example in the new book is that markets are not neutral instruments. Markets can, especially outside the domain of material goods, change the character of the goods being exchanged. So for example, if a parent, take a small example, some parents pay children for good grades or for studying hard. I don't know if you did that with your son. Did you? Well, do I pay my children yeah. to do what? For good grades. For, uh, to get good grade? grades in school. No, they refuse that, no. <laughs> you offered, but they refused so they don't, the They don't have good grades. <laughs> Maybe you didn't offer them enough. <laughs> but right. here's an example. There are some parents who pay their children yes. for an A to get a good grade or a high test score. And the impulse is understandable to try to motivate the child to do well in school. It's the use of, if you think about it, a market incentive or a cash incentive to do well in school or to read books. There are some uh, schools in the United States where the school pays children, young children, $2 for each book they read. Now, it's to try to encourage kids to read books. The result of that experiment was the young children, this was eight-year-olds, the young children did read more books. They also read shorter books. <laughs> but the real question is, what lesson does the monetary payment for reading books or getting good grades, whether it's by the school or by the parent, what lesson does that teach? The goal is to try to get the child to read more books or to get better grades. But the lesson that may be taught is that the reason to read books or to study hard is to make money. But that, can, that lesson can drive out attitudes toward learning and reading that are the ultimate goal of education, which is to learn to love reading and study for their own sake, not for the sake of making money. And so here's an example where introducing a market mechanism, a market incentive, the money for reading the book or for getting a good grade, may, will not be neutral toward the values at stake. The money may drive out, the market value 
may drive out or corrupt the, the higher good, the higher goal of cultivating a love of learning for its own sake. And this is, this is a question, I, it seems to me, we need to ask. Um, every time we, we use, we allow market values and market thinking and cash incentives to reach beyond the material, domain of material goods into health or education or family life or personal relations or civic life. And, and that's why the alternative is not simply between government imposed morality on the one hand or a neutral market mechanism on the other. We need to, to deliberate together about the attitudes and values that we think should govern education and health and civic life and personal relations and for that matter the relation to our own bodies. Um, rather than simply assume that market mechanisms are morally neutral mechanisms that will spare us the need to engage in the hard work of deliberating with one another, sometimes arguing and debating with one another about how properly to value the, the goods and values that inform these social practices. Um, plus the fact that it really is a pure myth to think that markets are a neutral thing. It is not. Mm. Absolutely not, yes. Um, Diane, do you want to say, do you want to raise a question or? Uh, Diane Ying, Ying Yunpeng, Tianxia Zhazhi Fashing Ren, is the publisher of Commonwealth Magazine, one of the most influential magazines of Taiwan. Diane, um, please be I, I, brief. Okay, my question is like a follow up question to what you just early raised. Uh, I think a welcome to Taiwan, particularly at this moment. Uh, I think Taiwan, just like what you uh, described in your next, your new book, What Money Cannot Buy, in which you described uh, very clearly that uh, market reasoning dominates a lot of things. But here, Taiwan's also similar situation uh, that uh, somehow it domin particularly, I think it uh, dominate, uh, influence the government decision making in many, many ways. Uh, just like mentioned, market can solve all the things. This is a popular thinking in Taiwan too. So welcome to Taiwan in this moment for us to rethink about the things. My question is that uh, in your traveling and lecturing all over the world, what's your feeling? Are you fighting a lonely fight? Or you see more and more people are seeing what you see? Or will we see the day that we can uh, turn the tide? Thank well, thank you very much for that question. Um, in the travels uh, that I've done over the last um, over the last six months since what money can't buy was published, and as it's being translated into various languages, one of the things that struck me is that there is a greater awareness of the need for a public debate about the moral limits of markets in almost every country I've visited outside the United States. The, the message uh, is, I find there's the most uh, resistance to uh, the message that we need to rethink uh, uh, and have a public debate about the limits of markets. The greatest resistance I've found is in the United States, which may, may be one of the most market-driven societies. And it's partly out of the experience of living and, and observing my own society, which may be at the cutting edge of the market triumphalist faith, or at least in the last three decades, uh, that I've, I've tried in this book to lean against the deep assumptions of my own society. And when I've traveled abroad, um, whether in Asia or in Europe, the UK or in, um, in South America, 
there, is, there seems to be a very keen awareness of the importance of questioning the reach of markets in domains of life where markets may not belong. But I would say that one common thread in the countries I visited, and I think this is true also of the United States, not only of, of Asia and Europe and, and Latin America, there does seem to be a widespread frustration with politics as it's currently practiced, a deep sense that there is something missing in the terms of public discourse. There seems to be a widespread desire for something better, for a politics that addresses, that engages more directly with big moral questions. And this is true in the US as well as in other societies. And also a desire for a politics that is more directly concerned with the common good. So this hunger for something better, uh, for a morally more robust kind of public discourse, I find everywhere I've gone. And if there's any, I never expected, I should say, that uh, either justice or what money can't buy would, would get the, re the reception and response that, that both books have have gotten, it's been a shock to me. Uh, I'm just a political philosophy professor after all. It's been uh, astonishing to me. But I think if there is an explanation, it's that there is such a great hunger and desire and yearning um, in most every place I visited to engage in reasoned public discourse about big questions. And there's a sense that our politics today and our public discourse today is not answering that, that desire, that yearning. And so that's what gives me hope. Even in my own market-driven society, that yearning, that hunger for a better kind of, of public discourse is what gives me hope that with hard work and th that it's possible to uh, provoke and to inspire a, a better way of conducting our public discourse. Thank you for that. Thank you, Don. dying to know this answer before I open the floor. That is, back, in, back home in the United States, um, people who strongly disagree with you, what do they attack you for? What do they say? Well, many I should say there's agreement and disagreement with what I'm trying to say, especially in my two recent books. There does seem to be a lot of agreement on the need for a morally more robust kind of public discourse, as I was just uh, suggesting. So that seems to be pretty widely shared. Of course, what to say in that dialogue that's where the disagreement comes, what positions to take. And I would say that the strongest objection or criticism or resistance to, especially to, to the new book, What Money Can't Buy, that I get from a certain segment of the population in the US. It comes from a strong market-based libertarian strand of opinion in the United States. And the argument is, doesn't this idea of questioning the reach of markets call into question individual freedom? 
Because if we are to have a public debate about how to value goods in education and in health and civic life and family life even, extending to questions of procreation, um, as in the case of surrogate motherhood and paid pregnancy, shouldn't we simply let each individual decide every moral question about markets and buying and selling for himself or herself? Why shouldn't consenting adults to a deal, to a transaction, be free to make whatever transaction, whatever deal, they mutually agree to? And isn't it a violation of individual freedom to think that we should have a public debate about these questions. That's the strongest argument of principle against my suggestion that we need to have moral deliberation and debate together in public about these questions. So to take a very concrete example, well take the example of prostitution which is a good test for this idea. If you have Two people who are willing to make a deal to sell sex for a certain amount of money, and if they're consenting adults, it's a voluntary exchange, why should there be any further question about the moral status of the deal they make? Or to take the question of paid pregnancy, should you be able to hire someone to carry a child pay them a certain amount of money, and then they turn the child over when it's born. This practice is legal in some US states, illegal in others. Most European countries prohibit it. Now, here again, the libertarian free market argument is, if a woman agrees it's worth it to her for the money she's offered, and if it's worth it to the couple paying the money, why is there any further question about whether the society should permit or encourage this practice? A deal is a deal. Um, and this que the same question could be asked about whether there should be a market in organs for transplantation. Some would say, now this is prohibited, uh, even in the US it's prohibited to have a free market in kidneys, let's say, for transplantation. And most countries uh, prohibit this. But the pure, principled, libertarian free market argument says you could increase the supply of kidneys if you allowed a free market in kidneys. And so if there is someone who is very poor and willing to sell his or her kidney, let's say, or cornea, can make money to feed his or her family or to provide for the education for his or her children. Why? And, and if there is someone willing to pay them a certain amount of money, it's worth it to them. It's a mutually advantageous deal. Doesn't individual freedom say there should be no further question about whether this should be permitted? So I disagree. I'm trying to argue that there are further moral questions in, each, in, in all of these cases. Um, but the critics of my position the pure free market laissez-faire critics say in each of these cases, whether selling organs or selling sex in prostitution or uh, paid pregnancy, these are strictly individual choices that the society as a whole should not debate as a collective question. And I'm leaning against that pure version of free market libertarianism and suggesting that there are other values. This is not the same as buying and selling flat screen televisions or cars. These are not material goods. These raise questions about the integrity of the human person, about human dignity, about the meaning of procreation and parenting and so on. Michael, can I press just one bit further? So uh, whether you are allowed, whether me, suppose I'm 18 year old and I grow up in China, I want to go to college, I don't have money to pay for my, for my tuition. 
And the only way I could make money is I could sell my kidney so that I can pay for my tuition, okay? Um, and you are saying that, well, let it be a public debate. But after the public debate, somebody has to make the decision whether it should go into the policy, into law. Somebody has to make decision. So uh, are you saying, well, whatever the public, after the public debate, the, you vote for a decision? How is the decision made? Well, in democratic societies, the, these questions are decided through voting. And the worry is that the, the democra democracy is, uh, democracy can get things wrong. Democracies can sometimes make the wrong decision about these moral questions. But it's important that the decision not be final, but that if the decision is wrong, that it's open to re-argument and continued debate. And uh, over time, uh, if the majority gets it wrong, then if there is continued discussion and debate, there is an opportunity to change it. The, the defenders of the pure market position, I think, um, wrongly assume that the contracting parties to a transaction always get the values right. But I think that's a flawed assumption also. I think there is no guarantee that a public discourse on moral questions will lead in every case to the right answer. Often majorities get things wrong. And what matters is that the debate continue even after, and that every decision of this kind be regarded as provisional and open to re-argument and to further debate. So my claim is not that the majority will always get the right answer, but that we can't avoid and shouldn't avoid public argument about, in this case, where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, where they may crowd out other values worth caring about. And because we have not had this kind of argument in our public debate, we have let markets too often decide this question for us. And that's what's emptied out, I think, our public discourse. And this is especially true. In the, you asked me about how it goes in the US. After, we've had two significant events that one would think might change the, the terms of public discourse. You mentioned September 11th. A second big event, uh, the financial crash of 2008. Many people assumed at the time of the financial crash and the bailout, publicly, public bailout of Wall Street banks and investment houses, I think most people assumed that now after about three decades of the market triumphalist faith, now would be a time to question that faith and to have a serious public debate about the moral limits of markets. After all, the financial crash brought not only my country, but the global economy to the edge of an economic crisis. And yet, in the four years since the financial crisis, we have had very little serious debate about the moral limits of markets. We've had some debate about regulation fairly technical debates about the regulation of Wall Street and the financial industry. But we have not had a serious public debate about the role of money and markets in a good society. And that's the kind of debate I think we need. I think that's the great missing debate in uh, our public life today. And that's the kind of debate I'm trying to encourage. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have many missing debates here domestically as well. Um, I really have to open the floor, although I really like to keep you for another hour. But um, 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 I'd like you to, to, to hear the voices of the Taiwanese here. So uh, the time is unfortunately limited because it's so engaging, all the topics here. So I open the floor now. I want to encourage you 
do not be inter, uh, intimidated by the language issue. English, Chinese, whatever language is all right. Okay, so uh, let's do it this way. The first round, I'd like to take three questions. Okay, one, and from this section, anybody? This section, two, and from that section, yes, this bare hand over there. Okay, one, two, three. And please make your question very, very brief so that others also have the chance to ask. Please, one, two, three. The microphones, please. Good evening, uh, Michael. Um, I'm teaching in uh, National Chengkung University. I'm teaching uh, political philosophy. And first of all, I agree with you about uh, bringing morality into public discourse. The first question would be, what kind of morality you're talking about? Because a uh, communitarian like you, co and co, is always criticized by people saying that you guys are committed to some sort of relativism, or at least relativism based on cultural differences. So when you come to Taiwan and you talk about morality, are you talking about our morality or your morality or some kind of universal morality? Because we're talking about human rights, which is supposed to be universal, quote unquote. Because if there are universal values and you, are, you were asked by the, uh, in the press conference about the monopoly of our media this afternoon. And you suggested that we should uh, value uh, media freedom and that kind of thing, and suggest that may be solved by making laws prohibiting uh, monopoly. But afterwards, you suggest maybe Taiwan has your own way to deal with it. And I'm just curious of how and why did you make these remarks? Because if press media, press freedom is so valuable, is it a kind of universal value that we all treasure? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I'm Suki from Malaysia. I'm a young politician. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here and ask you a question. And the topic of today is about good society. And I'm curious about what's the good society you are thinking about. And also, in the past very recent uh, presidential election in the United States, we have seen a lot of philosophical discourse and debate, especially on social issues like abortion. And uh, a Dr. Lo uh, Dr. Lovey. From Dr. Levy from Colorado College described this election as polarization, partisan, and philosophy. And these three P's leads to the Republican value in this election. So do you think the public discourse that happened in the past presidential election uh, is very important for the United States public? And um, also in your latest books, What Money Can't Buy. Uh, I finished reading your books on my way to watching your election in the flight, and I witnessed how the capitalism operating in your country is very exciting. I mean, the, how the United States capitalism operating. And do you perceive yourself as a social democrat? Because I see you have a very different views on your country's economic belief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, it's back there, please. Hi, hi, Professor uh, Mandel. I'm I'm a, I was graduated from the university, uh, National Tsinghua University, and uh, and uh, many of uh, our students in Tsinghua in National Tsinghua University are, are focused on an issue about about the concentration of the medium and. Uh, I think I have uh, some question about the first one, and so I want to uh, to know 
about the pros and cons or your perspe perspectives about these issues. Thank you. Two of the questions had to do with the concentration of the media, so let me begin with that question. I think it's important to, in order to have the kind of uh, reasoned public discourse that we've been discussing all evening, um, that all voices have to be heard in that public discourse, and that means that the media has to be open to a wide, the widest range of voices. This is why the concentration of power within the media um, is a danger. It's a danger because it threatens to prevent the kind of public deliberation that we've all been uh, discussing this evening. And it's an example uh, and this is, uh, it, it's a challenge that's being confronted uh, by societies around the world, including mine, the tendency of market forces to uh, lead to the domination of the media by uh, relatively few. And so I do think that this is a very uh, serious problem. Um, now, when in, in response to the first questioner, uh, how does this relate? Uh, the, the first questioner said this was an, it could, might be an illustration of whether I'm a relativist or a universalist in philosophy. Uh, and I want to, to be clear, the, I, I did suggest in the press conference that uh, each society may have a different way of implementing a policy that assures um, uh, pluralism in the media. I don't think there's one, any one single formula of regulation or of law that applies equally in every country because the, uh, the media situation uh, differs the way the media is organized, the way the media is financed, um, and, and the, the di diversity of the media varies from one country to the next. So what I was suggesting was not moral relativism. I was suggesting at the level of practice, working out the details of a policy to assure um, open access in the media, to avoid concentration of power in the media, I think each society does have to work out the details of this uh, for itself. And, uh, but that's not moral relativism, that's recognizing the practicalities of how legislation, how regulations would be most effective in one society as against another. But the principle is, I think, an important moral and civic principle that Whatever the details of the regulation, it's important to avoid letting market forces um, lead to the concentration of power in the media in a way that, um, that reduces the opportunity for voices uh, to be heard across the range of opinion. Um, then, to finally, to address the question of moral discourse in the U.S. presidential election. It is true um, that in the U.S. there does tend to be explicit moral discourse and moral argument about the question of abortion. And there is deep disagreement within American society about whether and under what conditions 
abortion should be legal. And we've been having uh, arguments and debates about this for some time. And uh, what I would say is this is one example of moral discourse that uh, does take place in American politics. But what I'm suggesting is that we, very, we, over, we conceive too narrowly what counts as moral discourse in politics. And by we, I mean in the US. When people talk about values or morality in politics, the first question they think about is, oh, that must be about abortion. And abortion is a serious moral question. The, the other question we debate in these terms is uh, whether the same-sex marriage. So when, when you hear the terms morality in politics in the US, the first two questions that come to mind are those two. They are both important questions, and they are both important public questions that raise moral and philosophical, and for some, religious convictions, and they should be debated. What I'm trying to suggest is those are not the only two questions that raise important moral issues. And so I'm trying to enlarge the terms of public discourse uh, and show that there are moral questions and ethical questions at stake, not only in the debate about abortion and same-sex marriage, but also in the question of rising inequality, growing gap between rich and poor, um, and also questions about the role and reach of money and, and markets, of the, the kinds of issues that we've been discussing here. Um, the, wall, the bailout of Wall Street is not only an economic question, it's also a moral question and a question of justice and of responsibility. So, as are the questions we discussed earlier about historic responsibility for past wrongs. So what I'm trying to suggest is, important though those two issues are in American public discourse, we need to broaden public discourse and broaden the moral vocabulary we bring to bear on economic questions as well as on these questions of abortion and same-sex marriage. I wonder if you forgive me that we have only time for the last round of three. Please do make your question very brief. Please, go ahead. Too much of bully events happened in Taiwan recently, and I believe it also happens in the whole around the world, even in the States. Uh, if you were the teacher in middle school or elementary school, uh, what would you do for the, for, to change the edu uh, situation, or uh, what would you do for the victims inside? Because we know too much of influence, and that's too powerful for them in the, for the victims. Thank, Thank you. you. And the second question here, please. 我想问一下就是说那现在我们提倡的人权正义与美好社会是不是都是一种以西方视野下的这种人权正义与美好社会就是说存不存在一种以东方为中心的一种人权正义与美好社会比如说我们在这边孙中山先生所说的大同社会还
and I conducted a, a dialogue with these 35 uh, junior high students about the subject of bullying. And I began by asking them about their experiences, whether they had been bullied, how they themselves have responded to bullying. We gave them some uh, scenarios, animated scenarios, of a new uh, child coming to a school, a transfer student, who was pressured to join in bullying and threatened that if she didn't join in the bullying, she herself would be made a victim of bullying. And so after we watched these animated scenarios, I asked these 35 uh, young students how they would respond, what they would do in her situation. Would they join the bullying? Or would they try to stop the bullying? Or would they try to be a neutral bystander and not get involved? What struck me about their answers, 15-year-olds, I find, 15-year-olds are very honest. And many of them, um, when I said, how many would join in the bullying, quite a number of them raised their hands. And they all made clear that they knew that it was the wrong thing to do. There was no ethical disagreement. But they were realistic and quite honest about the pressures they feel to join in with bullying, to avoid uh, being victims themselves. They were quite honest and articulate about that. Others, of course, said that they would not do it. Many wanted to be bystanders. And then we put other uh, scenarios to them. Suppose you were the victim. Would you consult with a parent or a teacher? Would you report it? And many of the students said that they would not. And so I probed to try to learn more about the reasons that they would not feel comfortable going to the teacher or even to a parent and reporting that they had been the victim of bullying. Why the reluctance? And they said, well, they had a would have a certain pride wanting to handle it by themselves and their parents might be ashamed to learn that they had been bullied. And so then we explored questions of pride and shame as experienced by 15-year-old kids. And as we explored those questions, we were led to bigger questions about the power of group identity and questions of individualism and group identity and whether there are differences in this regard across societies. What are the similarities? What are the differences? And this, then we were led finally to broader questions about, well, what is a good school like? And what relationships are there, not only among students, but between students and teachers? And should the outside community, should law enforcement, should the police be brought in to deal with bullying? Or should it be dealt with within the school itself? Should there be laws that require students to report bullying that they see? And in many American states, there have been enacted anti-bullying laws that require schools to act strongly against bullying. And we debated whether those laws would work in their setting. And to go back to the earlier question, this does not amount to moral relativism because the principle is, is that bullying is wrong, it's a serious problem, and we have to find ways to combat it and to reduce it and to empower the victims of bullying to seek, uh, to seek justice and remedies. And it's an educational challenge to, to educate children not to engage in the bullying. It's not only about the victims, it's also about educating those who fall into bullying. And so the moral principles are clear, and I think widely shared, uh, but which of the various solutions I've just mentioned that various countries have adopted, I think is a matter for each society to debate 
uh, and to try to uh, adapt to its own uh, situation. So another example of where allowing societies to come to, uh, to figure out how best to implement solutions does not amount to a kind of moral relativism. The, the, the moral issue here is clear and I think widely shared. The other uh, two questions touch on a similar question, which is what is the relationship between the philosophical tradition and arguments that I uh, present in my lectures and books and the Confucian tradition or Eastern traditions of thought. This is actually a question that interests me a lot because part of the dialogue that we've been discussing, uh, we've mainly been discussing ways of promoting and enriching moral discourse within societies. But I think a further challenge is to encourage and promote moral and ethical discourse across cultures and across civilizational traditions. And so I think the encounter between Western and Eastern philosophy can be one, uh, can be a very rich one and can be a source of mutual learning. And I've engaged in some gatherings, conferences with scholars of the Confucian tradition who are trying to bring the Confucian tradition to bear on contemporary uh, public life. And I've learned a tremendous amount from that. And I've, I've also been struck by some of the similarities between certain thinkers in the Western tradition, Aristotle, for example, who emphasizes uh, virtue and the importance of deliberating about the good life, even for the sake of deciding what the law should be, and aspects of the Confucian tradition, Confucius and Mencius, who also emphasized virtue and the, and the cultivation of virtue. And so I think we have a lot to learn from one another. One of the ways I've tried, apart from scholarly gatherings, to promote this mutual learning. Um, Michael, before you leave, oh, would you have the last words, I mean final words to and for our audience? Well, I suppose uh, we can call them some final words, but uh, 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 really it's the, it's uh, actually I hope that this is the uh, beginning of uh, a continuing conversation. I've, I've been in Taiwan now for all of maybe six hours, <laughs> and already I've learned, I feel as though I've, I've taken an entire semester course. I've learned already a great deal, and I really do um, come in a spirit of mutual learning. The form of the uh, lectures that I give uh, involve dialogue, and one of the benefits of that for me is an opportunity to learn from the questions and the comments and the arguments that, um, that readers uh, raise, that, uh, that are raised by students and members of the public. And this uh, dialogue this evening uh, with, with you and with uh, our, our intimate group of a few hundred people here has really... Six, 600. 600. Um, has really been um, a, a warm... The people outside watching the screen. I see. Well, it's been, it's been a, a rich uh, experience for me, and um, quite apart from the intellectual benefits, you've, um, you've made me feel very much at home, and I want to thank you for that. So, students, next time, if you want to get, engage a minister, Think of the example, bring candies, try candies, okay? Let's give Michael the warmest applause possible. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.